This episode of Reading Trek is brought to you by our patrons. You too can support this vibrant fan-based podcast network by visiting patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. For as little as $1 a month, patrons gain exclusive early access to some of our unedited shows, interviews, and will even get to join in on exclusive Patreon-only chats. We have lots more Patreon content on the way that you won't want to miss, so visit patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions Be sure to mention that Reading Trek sent you. Put down that remote, set your phasers to stun, and pick up that paperback. You do have books in the 24th century. Welcome to episode 10 of Reading Trek, a Star Trek book club podcast and proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. My name is William Conlon, and I am joined today by my co-host, Marty Ali. Marty, how are you today? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm relaxed. I'm ready to talk about Star Trek Invasion. How about you, Will? How are you doing? I am very excited to continue this series. Uh, as I've said many times, this series is a uh, very special part of my childhood, and I'm really excited to get back to it. So, uh, for those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a book club podcast working our way through the Star Trek Expanded Universe one novel at a time, discussing the characters, plot, writing, and piecing it into the larger Trek universe as we pull out the meanings and messages of the text. Although we do encourage you to read along with us, the show was designed to give all Trek fans a way to journey through the EU together, even if you haven't read the books. So, Marty, what is today's novel selection? Today's novel is Star Trek Invasion, The Soldiers of Fear by Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Roosh. Before we dive into this week's novel, we want to take a moment to talk about our voicemail contest. Reading Trek is holding a contest, and you can enter to win a brand new hardbound copy of the autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard by David A. Goodman. To enter, all you have to do is call our voicemail at 609 512 L-L-A-P, and leave us up to a two-minute message with your thoughts on the show or something we've been reading. That number, once again, is 609-512-5527. Hey, Will, do you know what I'd like to hear? What's that, Marty? The voices of our listeners. Oh, I would love to hear that. Will, do you know what I haven't heard yet? What's that, Marty? The voices of our listeners. That makes me sad. Don't make Will sad. Call 609-512-5527 and leave us a voicemail. We'd love to hear your voice. If you do that, you too will live long and prosper. Will, when and where does Soldiers of Fear take place? The Soldiers of Fear takes place in the year 2269, which would be roughly sometime during TNG's sixth season and Deep Space Nine's first season. Black alert, spoilers are ahead. Black alert. Black alert. Will, would you be so kind and turn the page? My pleasure. Eighty years after the Furies first returned to the Alpha Quadrant, Bobby Young is in command of Brundage Station, a remote listening post monitoring the sector of space that includes Furies Point. After detecting a minor drop in mass, one of the listening sensors is destroyed. Young and his crew converge and determine that the Furies have returned. After sending a Priority One message to Starfleet warning them of the danger, the station is attacked and goes silent. On board the USS Enterprise 1701-D, Commander Riker and his newly reassigned friend, Sam Redbay, are competing in a jet fighter dogfight simulation on the holodeck. Riker is the best-rated pilot in the fleet, but Red Bay is an accomplished test pilot and is keeping him on his toes. They are interrupted by Captain Picard, who is noticeably disturbed by a recent communication from Starfleet. The Enterprise bridge crew assembles and listens to top-secret orders from Starfleet. The Furies have returned, and the Enterprise is on the first line of defense. The ship prepares for battle and proceeds at maximum warp to Brundage Station. Once there, Riker, LaForge, and Data beam over to find the station full of ash and sulfur. Young is alive but catatonic, and his crew has been gruesomely murdered using ancient imagery associated with the devil and hell. 
Riker is shaken to the core by the condition of the station and its crew, and nearly breaks down while reporting the information back to Picard. The Enterprise proceeds to the site of the Fury's wormhole and positions itself in front of the five ships that have come through. Picard hails the Furies and is met with the sight of Virgo Vedil, a Fury species known as a Zebub. His sight immediately throws Picard off, and after a brief attempt at diplomacy, Vedil informs Picard that he is fear and cuts transmission. At the same instant, the entire crew of the Enterprise is engulfed in a wave of uncontrollable terror. Picard sees visions from his childhood. Red Bay recalls the day his parents were murdered. LaForge thinks he's on fire. The only person not affected is Data, who lacks emotions. After overcoming their initial wave of fear, the crew determines the Furies are using a beam through interspace to create a, a false sense of uneasiness. Red Bay and LaForge set out to find a solution. Meanwhile, Dr. Crusher is treating Young when she realizes how the wave of emotions must have affected Deanna Troy. She finds Deanna near death on sensory overload and has to carry her to sickbay. Troy is sedated and stabilized just in time. Shortly after, Dr. Crusher develops a mixture of Therogen, originally pioneered by Dr. McCoy, to help stave the effects of interspace, and a calming gas derived from Bajoran root tea. The Enterprise is forced to break away from Fury's Point to repair the shields and will be able to return right before a fleet of Federation, Klingon, and Vulcan ships arrive. Data hypothesizes that the wormhole the Furies are using to invade the Alpha Quadrant is manufactured and could be destroyed with a photon torpedo hit from a shuttlecraft. This would, however, be a suicide mission as the wormhole would close and the shuttlecraft would be trapped, surrounded by Furies, in the Delta Quadrant. Picard acknowledges the option, but wants to try diplomacy one more time. One of the Federation ships on its way has the poppets from the defeated Fury ship Wrath 80 years earlier, and Picard is going to make a peace offering with them. Upon return to Fury's point, Vadil is confused that the Enterprise has not yet capitulated in fear. Picard attempts to reason, but Vadil is enraged when Picard references the poppets. A battle ensues, and three shuttlecrafts are prepared for the wormhole mission. Worf and Red Bay are going to provide cover as Riker enters the wormhole. After launching and approaching their target, Riker and Worf's shuttles are disabled and Worf is killed. Red Bay decides he will carry out the mission and uses a maneuver named for him to fake out the Furies and enter the wormhole. Exiting on the other side, he fires his torpedo and destroys the wormhole, seemingly dying in the process. Worf's body is recovered by Dr. Crusher, and having only been dead for a few minutes, Crusher determines that she can revive him. Worf, Deanna, and Riker are reunited. Defeated, the remaining Furies sacrifice their ships once again, and Picard orders the pods full of puppets recovered and catalogued. Devastated by the loss of his friend, Riker sits with Picard in Ten Forward. Picard asks Riker to tell him about Sam Red Bay. To be continued. Very nicely done, Will. Thank you. What are some of your first thoughts after reading Soldiers of Fear? Well, um, to be perfectly honest, looking at this from an adult perspective, not from being a kid, I was a little let down. Um, I think the first book in this series was a lot better written. They were just, I mean, we were gushing last, last time around. You go back and listen to episode one of this series. Um, we were just really crazy about that book. I thought Diane Carey did an incredible job writing it. This one felt more like a mediocre TNG episode. Uh, there was a lot of repetition in it for me. I think they were almost trying to stretch the length of the novel. How about you, Marty? Yeah, I kind of agree with you on several points, um, which we'll probably talk about a little later in the show. But my first thoughts were um, a, a good angle on what could have been a, almost the same story as part one, because, I mean, it was really about diplomacy. So I'm glad they didn't rehash the story in part one. Um, 
there were lots and lots of moments referencing other episodes. Mm -hmm. I think the stakes were raised this time. There was more at stake. There were more ships. The ships were sleeker and meaner, which we can also talk about a little bit later. Um, But all around, like, I like where the story was going. I just don't think they quite got there. Yeah, I agree. Um, that being said, I have a ton of notes and a lot of highlights from the book. But um, Oh, me too. Yeah, it just it, it didn't feel like it was at the same level of quality as the first book in the series, which is one of those difficult things when you have a series where each book is written by a different author. I feel like if, um, if Diane Carey had had a crack at this, maybe it would have flowed a little better from the first one to this. Yes, I agree. Um, But we do have lots of positive things to say about this book as well. Um, Will, why don't you start us off? Absolutely. Um, What I did like is I liked the setup in that first chapter. Um, You have Brundage Station, which is a remote listening outpost. Uh, You know, obviously, if you have something as monumental as a massive, very hard to defeat ship and emerge from a wormhole, destroy a solar system and threaten to enslave an entire quadrant of space, you're going to want to do something about that. So um, 80 years prior to this book, the Federation has obviously set up a listening post and a station so that they are prepared should the Furies ever return. And uh, it's described right away that uh, life on Brundage Station was dull routine and punishment uh, for annoying a admiral. So you have this character, uh, Bobby Young, who just wants to ski and enjoy life, and he's uh, forced into Starfleet by, by his mother, who is afraid that he would die broke and without any skills. Uh, that one confused me a little bit because there was a whole money reference in there. I thought we would post money, but again, it sets up an interesting character in Young. Yeah, I agree. I I liked the character of Young. I I kind of wish he hadn't have gotten injured because I I wanted to get to know him a little better. Yeah. I think he had an interesting backstory that wasn't. It didn't really serve the story. I hope we get to see more of him in the next novel. Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I Like I said, I never read the DS9 one when I did the original uh, reading of this, so I'm very curious to see what kind of flow-through you have in the next one. Did, you didn't read it because you hadn't watched Deep Space Nine, isn't that right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I was at the point where I had just I was watching Voyager first time through, so I skipped DS9 and went straight to Voyager. Interesting. I was also 11 years old, so we'll see if I'm catch a little bit more this time around so far i have so one of my favorite moments was actually when we met which by the way if Mm -hmm. you mix up the letters in vadil you get devil it is an anagram of devil um i thought it was super creepy how he had these like maggots and bugs just like coming out of his eyes and his mouth and just crawling everywhere, including mm-hmm. like all over like the view screen and Yep. And his species, you know, because the Furies are a collection right, of multiple right. species. Um his species is a Zebub, which uh Beelzebub is a, is the devil in the Bible, if I'm correct. So there's there's a lot of reinforcement to this idea that the Furies are basically the um the demons that that have haunted numerous species in the Alpha Quadrant for millennia. I thought, okay, but because we're talking about Vidal, I didn't think he was used to his full potential. Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of the rare occasions where we might actually have more negative things to say than positive about the book. But yeah, and it's all it's all constructive though, because what we're looking for is we're looking for good stories and good flow through. Uh, and, and again, it's in the face of such a fantastic first novel as um, First Strike was. Now, we've heard a lot of feedback from people following the podcast that the third book, Time's Enemy, which we're going to be doing next, is actually the best of the series. So given how much we both love the first book, I'm really curious about the next book. So it's going to be like the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie then. Just kind of a bridge between two great novels or two great movies in Pirates' case. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think it will be. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see. Back to what I was saying. Tangent, sorry. Um, I thought he wasn't used to his full potential, Fidel. He it was almost like he was just a conduit for the real villain of the story, the real meat of the story to be told, which is, of course, um, fear and the crew's fear specifically. Um, I also expected more interaction between Vadil and Picard. The three conversations they had together felt like the same conversation. Yes, very much so. Um, and also, I felt it was a little, you know, cheap Bond villain-ish uh, of that scene that we got on the bridge of his ship. Where It was a little cliche, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, he's he's, you know commanding somebody downstairs and eating maggots and cutting off snakes and talking to his subordinates. It's just, it, it was a little pedantic. Anything else to say about Videl before we move on? Um, not really. I mean, we honestly didn't get nearly as much about him as we got of um, the Virgo in the first book. I mean, we had, you know, backstory and we had a lot of emotional development. He built a relationship with the characters that we know. So he started to figure out a dynamic. It just, there was a lot of, there was a lot lacking from this one. Not to rehash what we said, you know, on episode nine, but you know, that those interactions that Kirk had with with the villain of the story is what really made that story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like some of their dialogue back and forth was just tremendous. Okay. The door hadn't had a chance to close before Deanna Troy came in. She was in uniform, a habit she had started just recently. Season six. Season six, just after Jellico commands the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Oh, and those are... Those are my favorite episodes of TNG, Chain of Command. I love those episodes. There's a reference somewhere in here of Picard being tortured by the Cardassians too, right? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, there's so many nods to past TNG episodes. There's a reference to... <laughs> I can't find the, the exact quote, but it was Jordy talking to, I think, Worf about, like, do you remember when you met Kalis and Worth's just like, yes. And he's like, it's nothing like that. <laughs> I was just like, they just threw that line in there to reference an episode. Yeah, there was there was just a lot of that in here. So there were a lot of TOS references in there that I, I liked because we kept coming back to one of the best episodes of TOS, which is the Tholian web. You have the Furies are using uh, Interspace to develop this uh, fear beam that they're using on the Enterprise. Uh, and then the solution comes from the Tholian web as well. You have the Theragen, uh, which is a, a deadly toxin that McCoy deludes down and gives to the crew of the Enterprise 1701 to uh, help counter the effects of interspace that destroyed the uh, USS Defiant, or actually sent it to the Mirror Universe. We're not going to get into a deep dive of that, that rabbit hole, but, but um, uh, Crusher uses uh, Theragen combined with a root tea uh, from Bajoran root tea to uh, counter the, um, the fear beam. And I thought that was, that was some interesting teching the tech, as you like to call it, uh, on how, uh, how to come up with a solution to this uh, previously unseen weapon that I can only imagine how, how awful that would be. Yeah, I think this, the fear beam is what they called it. Yeah, that's a terrifying weapon, especially when it first that first wave hits the Enterprise. Did you think of um, what what you would see if that beam hit you? I absolutely know what I would see if that beam hit me. My personal greatest fear is being abandoned by those close to me, and that stems from um, being close to my mom uh, growing up. And then when I turned 20, I decided to come out to her, and then I got kicked to the curb and abandoned by her, in so many words. Um, she's tried to reconnect with me recently, but, you know. Yeah, just to go on a, a slight tangent, Marty recently wrote a phenomenal piece about that that actually got published in some online um, story blogs, and, and you won an award for it, correct? Yeah, I accept an award for it on uh, 
May 10th. Congratulations, Marty. It was, thank, it was a uh, thank you. really powerful piece. Um, yeah, that's that's something I've uh, kind of makes me feel bad that I just imagine spiders, but uh, you know, I have I have debilitating arachnophobia, so spiders are scary. I understand. <laughs> so um, you would be you would be running, screaming in terror from spiders, and I would be just you know, um, fetal position, rocking back and forth forever. In an empty field. In an empty... Yeah. Or an empty ship, like in that episode um, where Beverly Crusher... Remember Me. Yes, Remember Me. So glad you know these titles. Funny side note, that was the first episode I ever owned on VHS. Because my parents actually knew uh, the guest star on that episode, and they bought that episode for me. I think that is Beverly Crusher's best episode. Yes. I, I, best Beverly-centric episode. I, I agree 100%. I got to tell Gates that at a convention a couple of years ago. We had a great conversation about it. Uh, yeah, I love that episode. But again, tangent. <laughs> uh, no, Beverly really shines in this book, though. She does. I wrote the same thing down. And we don't get to see a lot of physicality from her, but the truth of the matter is she's a dancer, and she's very strong, not only strong-willed, but physically strong. So she carries Deanna Troy unconscious across the ship. Right? That's like such a hero moment. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Beverly in this book. Yeah, she was amazing. Um, I also really liked Troy in this book. I like the women in this book. Actually, basically, Troy's empathic abilities were used and used very properly because with all the terror that was flying around on that ship, Troy was overwhelmed and couldn't couldn't handle the experience. And her brain basically almost shut down because of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny, too, because when I was reading um, the book, I was a few pages ahead of that thinking, you know, Hey, this is happening. I wonder how Troy is right now. And then Beverly has that realization and goes and finds her. So, yeah, it's um, there was very good utilization of both Troy and Crusher in this. Uh, and I think it was a great hero moment, too, when Troy comes back to the bridge and she kind of, you know, staggers to her chair and kind of backs Picard up during that um, final diplomacy attempt. There, in, in all honesty, when I first watched TNG... I often thought, Troy, it didn't make sense because you had somebody on the bridge who could sense emotions in in an adversary. That is an unbelievable advantage. And for the amount of times on camera that Picard turns to her and says, hey, what's this guy thinking? I, I, I feel like she was an underutilized character for the whole of TNG. Yeah, I do too. But, um... I want to get back to fear for just a moment because I have a quote pulled out from Red Bay's perspective. Quote, beneath the control, beyond the terror, he had an awful feeling that something was missing, something that should have guided them all. He bent over another console and started the diagnostics. Then he realized what was wrong. No one had ordered a red alert. If Picard was right, then the entire crew had been hit with a bolt of fear. A literal assault on the senses. A clear attack, and Picard had not called red alerts. He had probably been too shaken to even think of it. And that worried Red Bay even more. I think this this passage gives us a clear understanding of just how powerful a weapon like fear can be. That you're not even, you know, aware that you're being attacked you're just afraid. And the amount of loss of focus that you have when you're, you know, blindsided by fear. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think of Red Bay as a character? He was a character that I think as soon as we were introduced to him, you know something bad's going to happen to him. Yeah. Because you can't have anything bad happen to the main cast members. So in order to create that kind of dramatic climax like this book had you have to create a new character and you have to make us love that character yeah and obviously um you know on tng you had guests guest actors come in and they do their great episode and they'd either die or they'd go off 
a great way of making us have an instant liking to him was, of course, make him Will Riker's best friend. So you're you're naturally going to like him because you envision yourself as being Riker's friend as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I related a lot to Red Bay, even though he didn't really have any, like, character ticks, really. So I think he's just, he's a likable character. And um, I don't think we've seen the last of him. No, he's uh, he's over in the Delta Quadrant. Who else is in the Delta Quadrant? Who, who, hmm. Who do we know that's been to the Delta Quadrant? Hmm. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm sure we're going to see him some more. Question. Yes. What exactly was Picard's fear? Grapes? Uh, gargoyles? Gargoyles? Grapes? Because it shows him, like, on a street in Paris... And then in his vineyard, and I didn't really, I didn't really get it. Well, he has that scene where he's talking to Guinan uh, about um, the gargoyles of Paris that terrified him as a child. So I guess maybe he was uh, he was looking on a street, looking up at the gargoyles or something. Maybe. Uh, yeah. You know what I was would have loved to have heard is I would have. I'm wondering what Guinan's fear would have been. Ooh. Maybe the Borg? Maybe, yeah. Uh, or Q. Or Q, because she was super afraid of Q. Yeah. I still want to know what the what the hand gestures mean, you know? Oh, well, we never did find out, huh? Maybe we'll find out in a novel. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are there are some several Q centric novels that probably give us a lot of insight on that. Maybe um when the autobiography of Guinan comes out we can I would actually love to read that book. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Um, Guinan's one of my favorite TNG characters. I think she had a, a very good two scenes. It's probably the best two scenes in the novel. Yeah, there's um, the just that idea of empty ten forward with Picard and Guinan talking in there. I, th- I really liked that. Uh, you had Picard seeking out guidance from Guinan, and I always love when he talks to her and you have that kind of old friend dynamic. Something that I thought was really interesting early in the um, novel as well was a reference that Picard has in his thoughts where he um, finishes the meeting with his bridge crew and he says, uh, as he watched his senior officers leave, he silently wished he could talk to Captain Kirk. Somehow Kirk had defeated hell itself and closed the door. Now that door had opened again, and unless it was slammed shut, the old term hell on earth would take an entirely new meaning, or a very old one. So, interesting that you have Picard, you know, envisioning himself talking to Kirk, and we all know in the timeline that two years after this, he's going to be on Viridian 3 doing just that. Oh, that's a great little foreshadow there. Mm -hmm. Was, Was this book published... Um, when Generations came out? I believe this book came out a year after Generations. Okay, so, so Generations had already happened. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that makes sense then. That That's definitely in there to reference Generations. Probably, yeah. And, and, and there's so much connection between TOS and TNG in here. Now, obviously, it's the second book in a series that bridges them, but... They talk uh, a lot about Kirk in this episode. They really do. They talk more about... And I say episode, I mean novel, but in my head, it was an episode, so... Well, yeah, we're all used to that when you do a Trek novel. It's 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 an episode. Um, or a movie. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there are more references to Kirk in this book than I think there is in the entire TNG TV series. And there is also a note in here that I personally love when Red Bay is talking to LaForge. You know where I'm going with this? Um, no. Ah, so let me bring this up real quick. Okay, here we go. Yeah, there's a there's another uh, TOS reference in here that I really like. When um, LaForge gives an estimate to Picard on time... Uh, Red Bay looks at him and says, I thought you said you needed 10 seconds, Red Bay had said. Captains always shave time off estimates, LaForge says. Build a bit of a shave into your estimates and you'll look like a miracle worker. I never would have thought of that, Red Bay said. 
Neither would I, LaForge said, moving to a new panel, but an expert once assured me it would work, and believe me, it has, every time. That is a reference to TNG Relics, where LaForge meets Montgomery Scott. So I love that little reference that they got in there, too. That was one of the references that didn't feel strained to me. So um, let's talk about the um, the Furies a little bit. Uh, we get a we get a slightly different group of Furies this time around. We still have the Medusa one that we saw the first in the first round, but um, we have the Zabub, and we have several others that are named in here. And then there's one that um, one of the ships that gets destroyed in the first battle. Uh, the character I'm just going to guess is named C. It's S S E. Yeah. And um, uh, Vadil says C had not been the best commander. Most of the corps could not see beyond her fluffy pink fur and wide blue eyes. Not all the Furies were monsters. So I didn't like that line personally because, you know. One of the things that actors say when they get cast as a villain is they never portray the character as a villain. They always try to justify their actions. So I didn't like that the writers basically made Vidil to think that they are monsters. In their minds, they should be the justified ones, and, and humans and Klingons and Vulcans should be the monsters. Yeah, that kind of irked me a little bit, too. I didn't, I didn't quite fit. I had to read it a few times to kind of like, what? And it also didn't help that I envisioned this character as basically being Jigglypuff from Pokemon. Oh, I envisioned a Care Bear. Yeah. So, um, speaking of that space battle, how cool was that ship when it blew up? How cool were the ships? They were like black hawks with their wings like in a nosedive. They reminded me of the the Vengeance from Star Trek Into Darkness with that, like, sleek black, that, like, jet black kind of look. And then the ships, these Hawk ships, were also, like, a shimmering black. So it's almost like a mirror flying through space is what I kind of envisioned it. Like a, um, a mecha hawk, if hmm. you will. Nice. Yeah, I mean the the visuals in this were were really good. Um I didn't again the writing in this one didn't feel at times as verbose as the first book, especially when describing like the battle sequences and then felt stretched at times in going on the dialogue. So there was almost kind of a reverse dynamic on, uh, on this yeah, book on the it first was one for me. Definitely more crew focused. It was it was all about the crew. It was not about the villains this week. This week, haha, <laughs> this novel. Um, the way the ship was destroyed with the photon torpedo because they knew how to f- frequency their torpedoes and lasers so that they wouldn't be absorbed by the new ships. Um, but then when that ship just starts spinning out of control, like with the red, almost like lightning I pictured, streaking across it, I was like, that would, that would make a really cool effect in a TV show. Yeah, totally. It, this is this is one series that I really wish had been adapted because it it would have certainly had the visuals. It, I was thinking that it would have been cool to have the like a TOS episode that had a villain like kind of bad like this, and then to pick it up in TNG. Yeah, well, can you imagine if, you know, in the future, Star Trek has those options? You had that very brief window of TNG DS9 overlapping, and then you had... But there was only, like, one or two one or two crossovers exactly TNG and DS9. You know, it wasn't a whole lot. Exactly. Imagine now, in the world that we live in, where everything is hyperlinked, right. say, say Discovery gets a companion show, almost like The Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead. Um, imagine if Discovery had like a crossover show, and you suddenly had plots that bridged entire series in, in more than just a, oh, look, that's cool, um, Jonathan Frakes is on this episode of DS9. 
like an like a like an early MCU kind of thing. Exactly. You're building you're building a grander universe. Yeah. You're having you're having the and and it, it's one thing to name drop, but it's another entirely to pick up the storyline where it leaves off, yeah. you know. And and it's got a long history of, of crossover events. Sorry, I know I mention this to you all the time, but I'm a big fan of Stargate SG one and Stargate Atlantis. Oh, I wasn't aware I'm, of that. Those two shows aired together for three years, and during those three years, there was a lot of kind of storyline crossover. Like, something would happen in Atlantis that would affect SG-1, and vice versa. So, that was, like, really the first time I saw something like that happen, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Like, I wish more shows did this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 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 now we have um, the DC TV universe... And those shows cross over at least once a year, um, where all of the characters just kind of come together and do this one big grand story. Um, there was even one episode where, one episode of The Flash, where he did something that affected the multiverse. And then on the next episode of Arrow after that, one of the characters who had a daughter ended up having a son instead because Flash messed up the universe, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting with Discovery to see, um, you know, in the first season of Discovery, they actually, there was some time travel when they came back on the Spore Drive. Uh, they were like a year or, excuse me, like nine months ahead. So they're only about eight years out now from when uh, Kirk is in charge of the Enterprise. So if Discovery has a good long run, like six or seven seasons like TNG did, then you could probably get them to the point where they're overlapping with TOS episodes. But then they'd have to recast William Shatner, and nobody wants that. No, I, I just I believe that time can advance, and you can recast roles, and you have to kind of let things just keep going. But back to uh, back to Soldiers of Fear, we digress. <laughs> um, speaking of some of the tech things, uh, let's talk about at, right at the end of the novel when Red Bay goes into the wormhole. Uh, I like the reference that they did here to DS9 because they say the inside of the wormhole was nothing like they described the wormhole at Deep Space Nine. This one swirled gray and black with the line of Fury ships being nothing more than hulking shadows streaking past. So I like that they changed this wormhole from the one that we know so well from DS9 because that's a natural wormhole or, or you know, it's created by the prophets. Uh, and this one is one created by the Fury, so it's manufactured a whole different way. And it's black like their ships. And their hearts. Very ominous. There's a moment it, near the end of the book where Guinan says, I don't think special occasions are always celebrations, Guinan said. She put the brandy down between them, Riker and Picard, poured a centimeter of purple liquid into the bottom of each glass, and pushed them towards her customers. Mm-hmm. Sometimes special occasions are the quiet moments when your healing can begin. Yeah. Yeah. What that, do you think about that? That that last that whole last scene with Guinan, Riker, and Picard was, I think, the most TNG moment of the um, of the book. Yeah. Because it had that, um, you know, TNG is very poignant at times, and and it actually. Uh, not to say that TOS and the other shows aren't, but TNG had a lot of thought behind it, and obviously that was the series that I first grew up with, so I, I love it the most, and I just thought that was a great TNG moment. It was. It was one of my favorite moments in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I only have one that's ahead of that, but I'm saving that for the end. Okay. Well, I have a moment I'd like to discuss here. Yeah, go for it. Um, it's chapter 18 where Troy and Crush are talking, and they're, they're talking about the um, fear and emotions that are coming from the Furies. And they're talking about how it's only gotten worse for them in the last 80 years since their defeat at the hands of the original Enterprise. Uh, and, and it just made me stop and think. I, I stopped on this chapter and I thought for a few minutes, can you imagine being in a culture where you're entire focus of existence is revenge it just the, the the sheer sadness of the furies as a, as a race and a species um 
it, it's just mind boggling. I, I was just watching a um, interview not too long ago with uh, Mandy Patinkin. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people out there are big fans of the Princess Bride, and he plays that iconic role of Adigo Montoya. And he was saying in this interview that everybody always quotes the famous line, you killed my father, prepare to die. But the line that he is most struck with um, in the film is after all of that. At the end of the film, he has a line where he says, you know, I've been in the revenge business for so long. Now that I'm done, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. Uh, and I just thought it, it's uh, such a sadness of the Furies that, you know, their their sheer existence is revenge against humanity and Klingons and Vulcans. So it's just there's a, a, a real deepness to their species and their character. And it's also interesting to think of the mechanics of where they get to this point, because at the end of the first book, 80 years earlier, you have them send off that... Um, that message at warp 25, I think is what they say. Well, yeah. okay, even at warp 25, it probably would have taken, you know, a few years to get to the Delta Quadrant and they process it. So they didn't really get like ship's logs or an understanding that Kirk was trying to be diplomatic. They they basically got like the message that this is, this is the place that they were seeking. Humanity is evil. So what you probably had is you probably had 70 years worth of um, you know, nationalistic fervor, if you will, uh, of the Furies developing this intense hatred of, of humanity and all the other um, species in the Alpha Quadrant. It almost reminds me of of the, the Renal from the Prometheus series. Yeah, it's interesting to see the, I think one of the key themes of Star Trek and what people have to overcome in Star Trek is, you know, ongoing xenophobia. You know, you have interplanetary xenophobia whereas you know nowadays here on earth we're dealing with it every single day so it's just you know kind of a projection of the problems that our cultures are dealing with you know put into space and it's just uh you know it's all a giant looking glass i think for us to look back at ourselves as all good science fiction should be yes indeed but i think that's a good time to uh transition into shelve it where we normally talk about the messages, meanings, and give our ratings. Absolutely. Marty, why don't you start? Big message that I pulled out of this book was that you have to overcome your fears if you want to succeed. Um, going back to what I shared earlier, um, I'm currently you know, working through all of that because... I realized that my fear of being abandoned is hindering me making personal connections. So um, I have to overcome that fear if I want to make personal connections. And that's very important to me. So um, it's something that I'm currently struggling with. So I completely sympathize with the Enterprise crew in this novel um, and there's one line that I pulled out that kind of represented all of those thoughts. Um, fear is the most protective of all our emotions, but it cannot govern our lives or our deeds. And I think that line was the real meat and potatoes of this book. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of, my meanings for this were very similar and what I pulled out of it. I, I, my big thought was that, you know, fear is a powerful weapon, but it's also a fleeting weapon. You can't use it forever. And, you know, a strong will will always, you know, supersede fear. Agreed. And I'm not just saying that because my name is Will. Um, all right, Will, what are your final thoughts on Soldiers of Fear? I think we'll wrap it up. Well, final thought is, could have been better. Um, not quite as good as the first one. I am giving this a warp 5.5, so we're at cruising speed. Well, if we're in season six, wouldn't that be maximum warp? Yeah, season six is, a, is an awesome season. This wouldn't have had a place in season six as far as I'm concerned. It, it, needed, some, it needed some rewrites. This, um, this book needs some Diane Carey rewrites. My thoughts are pretty much the same. I think 
the story kind of was repetitive. Not that it was repetitive of the previous novel, but that they repeated a lot of things like, we think the fear is artificial. I think they went over that three times before they actually like, yes, you're right. It's artificial. Mm-hmm. Um, and same thing with the conversations Picard had with the Dell. It was the same conversation three times. And so I'm not sure what was going on there. Not to mention it was noticeably shorter than the previous novel. Um, I marked less in this book than I did in part one. I marked part one up. That's covered in yellow. Mm-hmm. Um, but not so much for this one. Not that it's... I mean, I don't want to say anything that would offend the authors or anyone. But, you know, it just it just wasn't written as well as the first one. And it and it it was noticeable. But I did like the story. I liked the villain, the fear. I think fear was a very good villain. Um, and I really like that last battle scene. I gave this um, 2.5 deltas out of 5. So I'm also at warp 5, if I calculate that correctly. Mm-hmm. So we have given this the same rating. Cue the defiant torpedoes. Pew, 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 pew. All right. Well, what are we reading next time on Reading Trek? I wasn't aware you indulged in the literature of fantasy. Light reading is considered relaxing, Captain. Next time on Reading Trek, we are covering Star Trek Invasion Time's Enemy by L.A. Graff. This is part three of the Invasion series. A millennia ago, an apocalyptic battle was fought in the Alpha Quadrant. The losers were banished. But what became of the victors? The Federation is threatened by this ancient mystery when a battered and broken version of the Defiant is found frozen for 5,000 years in an icy cloud of cometary debris. Captain Sisko and the crew of Deep Space Nine are summoned to answer the most baffling question of their lives. How and when will their ship be catapulted back through time to its destruction? And does its ancient death mean that one of the combatants in the primordial battle is poised now to storm the Alpha Quadrant? Only the wormhole holds the answer. And the future of the Federation itself may depend on the secrets it conceals. Well, what do you think's going to happen as we read ahead to the next novel? Well, I legitimately can't tell you because I have never read this one. But now I have the perspective of having watched Deep Space Nine, so I'm excited to see. And I like that we've got some time travel component in here. Uh, just reading I'm that- so excited that it's going to be uh, wibbly-wobbly-timey-wimey. Um, because those are my favorite kind of stories. So I'm so excited to read this book. Well, you know, what? one of my favorite, like, inside Trek jokes, and it's a deep cut, but, you know, I know a lot of diehard Trekkies. So in Star Trek First Contact, just the way that Riker says the words time travel, time travel. When, he's, when they're watching the Borg sphere go back in time, it's like it's just like the best piece of just random exposition in, in cinema history. So, you know, there's often times in my life where I'm just talking to people and we want to explain something away and I'll just go, time travel. Time travel. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, where we go with this. My first thought when I read this description was Time's Arrow, which is uh, another great multi-part episode of TNG, but you remember they, uh, they're they doing uh, archa- um, archaeological excavations in San Francisco and they find a, a 400-year-old version of Data's head. And that sets, off, sets in motion this whole time travel story that sends Data back to San Francisco in the 18, 1800s. So, yeah, so it's very interesting to uh, to see where they go with this on Deep Space Nine, and I'm very curious to see how. Uh, I don't know if if it's um, if they've got the Defiant, then I assume it's Captain Cisco at this point, not Commander Cisco. Let me take that over again because it says it in the description. I think there's going to be another little time jump because this novel um, takes place in the time um, DS9 season one, so he was still Commander then. And he didn't have the Defiant. Yeah, so now he's got the Defiant and he's a captain. Right. So we're and a couple of years ahead. that was season three, I think, when mm-hmm. they got the Defiant. 
Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see where they go with this. And we're gonna and we're gonna have some guests for that show. We'll make it a surprise who's joining us, but um, we're gonna have some we're gonna have a guest for that show, and it'll be nice to bring somebody else in to talk about this series. Fresh blood. Yes, indeed. So, Marty, why don't you tell them about our um, voicemail contest one more time, and then we'll close this episode out. Uh, Well, once again, we'd love to hear your voice, and you can enter to win a copy of the autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard, which we're going to be covering. I promise it's coming soon. I know we keep saying that, but it really is just around the corner. Um, So leave us a voicemail with your thoughts on the show on Star Trek Invasion, on Time's Enemy, on anything, really. Um, The number, once again, is 609-512-LLAP. That's 609-512-5527. Be sure to leave your name when you call so that we know who you are. Um, Will, how can people get a hold of you if they want to continue the conversation? I am on Twitter at William G. Conlin, and you can find me in the unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas Facebook group, which is moderated by our good friends and tricorder transmission fearless leaders, Heather Barker, Jeff Hewlett, and our good Star Trek Las Vegas friend, Jesse Okendo. Great place to have discussions. How about you, Marty? I'm also in the same group on Facebook, and you can also reach me on Twitter at Time Travel Marty. Um, If you'd like to reach the show, you can reach us by sending us a tweet at ReadingTrek on Twitter by email, readingtrekpodcast at gmail.com. As always, a list to our upcoming selections can be found on our webpage at readingtrek.thetricordertransmissions.com. And with that, Captain Picard wants us to let him read in peace. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. See, but would you be like, would you be something ferocious like a T-Rex? Or would you want to be like a gentle giant like a Brontosaurus? Triceratops. Triceratops? Hmm. What about a raptor? I'm not that bitchy. <laughs>